Number four, the horror in the eyes. There can be nothing normal in the mind of one who, knowing what I knew of the horrors of Tempest Mountain, would seek alone for the fear that lurked there. That at least two of the fierce embodiments were destroyed, formed but a slight guarantee of mental and physical safety in this echelon of multiform diabolism. Yet I continued my quest with even greater zeal as events and revelations became more monstrous. When two days after my frightful crawl through that crypt on the ice and claw, I learned that a thing had melancholy hovered twenty miles away at the same di instant the eyes were glaring at me. I experienced virtual convulsions of fright, but that fright was so mixed with wonder and alluring grotesqueness that it was almost a pleasant sensation. Sometimes in the source of a nightmare, when unseen powers whirl one over the roofs of strange dead cities, toward the grinning chasm of Nice. It is a relief and even a delight to shriek wildly and throw oneself voluntarily along with the hideous vortex of dream doom into whatever bottomless gulf may yawn. And so it was with the waking nightmare of Tempest Mountain. The discovery that two monsters had haunted the spot gave me ultimately a mad craving to plunge into the very earth of the accursed region and with bare hands dig out the death that leered from every inch of the poisonous soil. As soon as possible, I visited the grave of Jan Martens and dug vainly where I had dug before. Some extensive cave-in had obliterated all trace of the underground passage, while the rain had washed so much earth back in the excavation that I could not tell how deep they had dug the other day. I likewise made a difficult trip to the distant hamlet where the death creature had been burned, and was little repaid for my trouble. In the ashes of the fateful cabin I found several bones, but apparently none of the monsters. The squatter said the thing had only had had only one victim, but in this I judged him inaccurate, since besides the complete skull of a human being, there was another bony fragment which seemed certainly to have belonged to a human skull at some time. Though the rapid drop of the monster had been seen, no one could say just what the creature was like. Those who had glimpsed it called it simply a devil. Examining the great tree where it had lurked, I could discern no distinctive marks. I tried to find some trail into the black forest, but... On this occasion could not stand the sight of those morbidly large bulls, or of those vast serpent-like roots that twisted so malevolently before they sank into the earth. The next step was to re-examine with microscopic care the deserted hamlet, where death had come most abundantly, and where Arthur Monroe had seen something he never lived to describe. Though my vain previous searches had been exceedingly minute, I now had some new data to test. For my horrible grave, Qual convinced me that at least one of the phases of the monstrosity had been an underground creature. This time on the 14th of November, my quest concerned itself mostly with the slopes of Cone Mountain and Maple Hill, where they overlooked the unfortunate hamlet, and I gave particular attention to the loose earth of the landside region in the latter eminence. The afternoon of my search brought nothing to light, and dusk came as I stood on Maple Hill, looking down at the hamlet and across the valley to Tempest Mountain. There had been a gorgeous sunset, and now the moon came up, nearly full and shedding a silver flood over the plain. The distant mountainside and the curious low mounds that rose here and there. It was a peaceful Arcadian scene, but knowing what it did, I hated it. I hated the mocking moon, the hypocritical plain, the festering mountain, and those sinister mounds. Everything seemed to me tainted with a loathsome contagion and inspired by a noxious alliance with distorted hidden powers. Presently, as I gazed abstractedly at the moonlit panorama, my eye became attracted by something singular in the nature and arrangement of a certain topological element. Without having any exact knowledge of geology, Geology, I had from the first been interested in both the odd mounds and hummocks of the region. I had noticed that they were pretty widely distributed around Tempest Mountain, though less numerous on the plain than near the hilltop itself, where prehistoric glaci glaciation had doubtless found feeble opposition to its striking and fantastic caprices. Now in the light of the low moon which cast long weird shadows, it struck me forcibly that the various points and lines of the mount system had a peculiar relation to the summit of Tempest Mountain. That summit was undeniably a centre from which 
The lines of rows of portions points radiated indefinitely and irregularly, as if the whole unwholesome Martens mansion had thrown visible tentacles of terror. The idea of such tentacles gave me an unexplained thrill, and I stopped to analyze my reason for believing this mound's glacial phenomena. The more I analyzed, the less I believed, and against my newly opened mind there began to beat grotesque and horrible analogies based on superficial aspects, and upon my experience beneath the earth. Before I knew it, I was uttering fancied and disjointed words by myself. My god, mole hills. The damned place must be honeycombed. How many? That night at the mansion. They took Bandit and Toby first, on each side of us. Then I was digging frantically into the mound with that stretch nearest me. Digging desperately, shiveringly, but almost jubilantly. Digging and at last shrieking aloud with some unplaced emotion as I came upon a tunnel or burrow just like the one through which I had crawled on that other demonic night. After I recall running, spade in hand, a hideous one across moonlit mount marked meadows and through deceased precipitous abysses of haunted hillside forest, leaping, screaming, panting, bounding towards the terrible Martins mansion. I recall digging unreasoningly in all part of the briar-choked cellar, digging to find the core and center of that malignant universe of mounds. And then I recall how I laughed when I stumbled on the passageway, the hole of the base of the old chimney, where the sick weeds grew and cast queer shadows in the light of the lone candle I had happened to have with me. What still remained down in that hell hive, lurking and waiting for the thunder to arouse it, I did not know. Two had been killed, perhaps that had finished it. But still there remained that burning determination to reach the innermost secret of the fear, which I had once more come to deem definite material and organic. My ind indecisive speculation whether to explore the passage alone and immediately with my pocket light or to try to assemble a band of squatters for the quest, was interrupted after a time by a sudden rush of wind from outside, which blew out the candle and left me in stark blackness. The moon no longer shone through the chinks and apparatus above me, and with a sense of fateful alarm I heard the sinister and significant rumble of approaching thunder. A confusion of associated ideas possessed my brain, leading me to grope back towards the farthest corner of the cellar, my eyes, however, never turned away from the horrible opening at the base of the chimney. I began to get glimpses of the crumbling bricks and unhealthy weeds as fine glows of lightning penetrated the woods outside and illumined the chinks in the upper wall. Every second I was consumed with a mixture of fear and curiosity. What would the storm call forth, or was there anything left for it to call? Guided by a lightning flash, I settled myself down behind a dense clump of vegetation to which I could see the opening without being seen. If heaven is merciful, it will some day efface from my consciousness the sight that I saw, and let me live my last years in peace. I cannot sleep at night now, and have to take opiates when it thunders. The thing came abruptly and unannounced. A demon, wet like scurry, scurrying from pits remote and unimaginable. A hellish panting and stifled grunting. And then, from that opening beneath the chimney, a burst of mutidonous and leprous life. A loathsome night, spawned flood of organic corruption, more devastatingly hideous than the blackest conjurations of mortal madness and morbidity. Seizing, stewing, surging, bubbling like serpent slime, it rolled up and out of that yawning hole spreading like a septic contagion and streaming from the cellar at every point of Igress, steaming out to scatter through the accursed midnight forest and through fear, madness and death. God knows how many there were. There must have been thousands. To see the stream of them in that faint, intermittent lightning was shocking. When they had sent out enough to be glimpsed as separate organisms, I saw that they were dwarfed, deformed, hairy devils, or apes, monstrous and diabolic caricatures of the monkey tribe. They were so hideously silent, 
There was hardly a squeal when none of the last specters turned with the skill of long practice to make a meal in a accustomed fashion on a weaker companion. Others snapped up, snapped up what it left and ate with slavering relish. Then in spite of my days of fright and disgust, my morbid curiosity triumphed, and as the last of the monstrosities oozed up alone from that neither world of unknown nightmare, I drew my automatic pass pistol and shut it under cover of the thunder. Sweaking, slithering, torrential shadow for wet, vicious madness, chasing one another through endless and sanguine corridors of purple fulgurous sky. Formless phantasms and kaleidoscopic mutations of a ghoulish, remembered scene. Forests of monstrous, overnourished oaks with serpent roots twisting and sucking unnameable juices from an earth, venomous with millions of cannibal devils. Mound like tangled tentacles groping from underground nuclei of polypus perversion. Insane lightning over malignant ivied walls and daemon arcades choked with fungus vegetation. Heaven be thanked for the instinct which led me unconscious to places where men dwell. To the peaceful village I slept under calm stars of clearing skies. I had recovered enough in a week to send to Albany for a gang of men to blow up the Martins Mansion and the entire top of the Tempest Mountain with dynamite. Stop up all the discoverable mount mirrors and destroy certain overnourished trees whose very existence seemed an insult to sanity. I could sleep a little after I'd done this, but true rest will never come as long as I remember that nameless secret of the lurking fear. The thing will haunt me, for who can say the extermination is complete? and that analogous phenomena do not exist all over the world. Who can, with my knowledge, think of the Earth's unknown caverns without a nightmare, dread of future possibilities? I cannot see a well or a subway entrance without shuddering. Why cannot the doctors give me something to make me sleep, or truly calm my brain when it thunders? What I saw in the glow of my flashlight after I shot the unspeakable straggling object was so simple that almost a minute elapsed before I understood and went delirious. The object was nauseous, nauseous, a filthy whitish gorilla thing with sharp yellow fangs and matted fur. It was the ultimate product of mammalian degeneration, the frightful outcome of isolated spawning, multiplication and cannibal nutrition above and below the ground. The embodiment of all the snarling chaos and grinning fear that lurked beyond life. It had looked at me as it died, and its eyes had the same odd quality that marked those other eyes which had starred at me underground, and excited cloudy recollections. One eye was blue, the other brown. They were the dissimilar Martin's eyes of the old legends, and I knew in one inundation cataclysm of voiceless horror what had become of that vanished family. The terrible and thunder-crazed house of Martens.